How many of you know who you were? <laughs> Say, I know who I am. I know who I am. I walk in favor. I walk in favor. I'm working miracles. I'm working miracles. I know who I am. I know who I am. Chosen generation, we've been called for to show His excellence. All I require, all I require, all I do, God has given me. And I, I know who I am. We are a chosen, come on. We are a chosen generation. We've been called for to show.
there you are. You may be seated. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, Pastor Benny, uh, they talk a lot about, we're in America here, and they talk a lot about an American story. When someone is successful, they say, oh, it's a great American story. Your story is not an American story. Your story is like the story of Peter the Apostle. It's like the story of John, the apostle of Christ. Or any of the great apostles in the Bible. A story of faith, hope, love. And we salute your courage. And all that the Lord has used you to do in the lives of so many around the world. And guess what? The seeds you planted in so many nations of the world are growing tremendously. <laughs> tremendously. Hallelujah. You know, that was a beautiful song. Did you like it? Yes. It's a good one. And, you know, for several reasons. And I'm going to tell you. You know, we're living in a day in which so many uh, have set aside the scriptures. And they're looking for answers. And they think the Bible is old-fashioned. They think its message is unnecessary. But that's not true. You know, a lot of times I ask Christians, you believe the gospel? And they say, yes. And I say, what is the gospel? And one of the terrible things that I found out is that so many don't really know what the gospel is. How can you believe something you don't understand. How? How can you believe it? You don't understand it. You have to understand it first. In Proverbs chapter 4, in verse number 7, the Bible tells us wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Tell somebody wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. He didn't say money is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. So he says, therefore, get wisdom. Then he says, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Understanding. How important is understanding? You know, Jesus told a parable, a parable, uh, a parable of the man, the sower, that went forth to sow. And he says, as he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and picked them up. In his interpretation, Jesus said, the seeds that fell by the wayside are those who hear the word of God and don't understand it. Then he said, then Satan comes immediately, not later. Satan comes immediately and steals away, takes away the seeds. And here's something very important. He says, the seeds that were sown in their hearts. Meaning that the word actually got into their hearts. But they didn't understand it. So the devil took it away from them. You have to understand the message. The gospel. So number one is to understand it. You've got to understand it. Understand the gospel. If you understand the gospel, you will never need another fire. You know, as we minister to people from all over the world, we find so many who are looking for second fire, third fire. Second anointing, third anointing, fourth anointing, double anointing, triple anointing. You know, they're looking for all of these things. And it's because they don't understand the scriptures. They don't. They don't. They don't. You can tell from the songs they sing. You can tell. 
You can tell. That's one I sang for a long time too. And one day I was singing it again. The Lord said, stop it. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong with it? He said, listen to yourself. Can I, I can sing it to you. Some of you know it. It's sung in churches. It will tell you why the churches are filled with babes. Babes, even the pulpit. There's a lot of babes. But you see, Jesus is coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish or any such thing. He's coming for a grown church. Hallelujah. Because he said that we may be no more children tossed to and fro. All right? He tells us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Doesn't want us to remain kids, babies. Got to grow. How many of you sing? Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup, fill it up and make me whole. The way I sang it would tell you I really knew how to sing it. Good. Yeah? And so one day I'm with my hands up again. Lord, fill my cup. Lord, he said, stop it. I thought, wow. Because I, I thought I was the only one in the room. What is it? Stop it. And I went, what's wrong with you? The beautiful thing about God that has amazed me, one beautiful thing, because there's so many, many beautiful things. But one beautiful thing is that when God talks to you, you are able to reply him without fear. It's amazing. I mean, if people who have authority over us talk to us, we might be scared. You know, you, you kind of cringe inside. You don't know what to say. But when God talks to you, you reply. You respond without fear. It's amazing. You would think because he's so great. If you heard the voice of God, you'd think you'd be paralyzed. <laughs> no. It takes the fear away. Read your Bible. Look at all those men and women that responded to God when God talked to them. And they replied, God. How could they have dared to reply God that way? Because when God talks to you, he lets you be you. You're bold in his presence. Think about it. Fill my cup, Lord, with what? No, 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 with what? What do you want? Come and quench this thirst thing. Jesus said to the woman at the well, Anybody who drinks this water shall thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give, you will never thirst. For that water will be in you a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You will never thirst again. How can you say, fill my cup, I lift it up? With what? If you have Christ, you will never thirst again. But they don't know it. They don't know it. It says, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. But I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men. Why? Because they know not. Neither do they understand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. How could that be? Jesus said, the bread of God is the one who came down from heaven. And gives eternal life to men. And who is that? Jesus. If you have him, you will never hunger again. That's what he said. So why do we sing it? Because we don't know. We don't really understand. We are touched by the songs. So we sing them. There's another one to sing. And all churches have been singing them for many, many years. Many years. They say, uh, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord 
How could you crown him? How dare you? You're asking for the royal diadem and you're going to crown him? Because you don't know who he is. You see, the songs make no sense. You get it? But we just sing them. We are touched by them, so we sing them. And so what happens is, we remain at a certain level of Christianity. A certain level. And we can't go further. And we don't know why. Because you're living a lie. You see, God will bless you as much as he can. Why? That's as much as you can take. You see. Because if you can take more, you're just going to end up there. At that level. They which receive, remember. They which receive, Romans 5, 17. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. They which receive abundance of grace. Not they which are given. They which receive, how much can you take? They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. By one, Jesus Christ. They shall reign in life. They which receive. How much can you take? Paul writing to Timothy said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong. Take advantage of the grace. How much have you taken advantage of? So we just bring forth the royal dad. Crown him. Crown him. You. Are you going to crown him? You. Do you know who he is? We should sing it differently. He has the royal diadem. For he is Lord of all. You get it? You see, I I tell people, don't just sing because it sounds nice. Listen to what you're singing. Jesus said, you worship, you know not what. But we know who, what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. He said, you worship what you don't know. That's a problem. They worship, but they don't know what they're worshiping. What's the problem? They don't understand the gospel. They don't know what it is. So they're asking, asking all the time. When are you going to grow? Asking all the time. When are you going to grow? When are you going to learn to say, Satan, no more? When are you going to, do you know who we are? In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he calls us associates of the God kind. Which means we belong to a heavenly pantheon. This is reality. Think about it. If Jesus came, if it is true, if it is true, I want you to just think about this. If it is true that Jesus came to this world and that Jesus was truly the Son of God, if this is true, that he came to die for us, And that God raised him from the dead. He shed his blood for us. If he actually paid all that sacrifice for us. Do you think we're supposed to live a beggarly life? Have you ever gone to the shop and you paid so much for so little? When you pay something, they give you your money's worth. Right? And you take that thing away and you get home and say, look, I bought these shoes for X, Y, Z amount of dollars. That means that's the value. You accorded it that much value and paid for it. I thought many years ago, I thought if Jesus gave himself for me, I must be as valuable to him as he thought of himself. I thought about it. I thought about it. I was too young to go in the wrong direction. I didn't want to live my life uh, in a wrong way. I wanted to make sure if I was going to believe something, I believe the truth. My grandfather was a pastor. My grand uncle was the founder of Assemblies of God in Nigeria. Assemblies of God Church. And he had five brothers. All of them were pastors. So I I grew up from that kind of home. I don't want to just take something and believe it. And find later I was believing a lie. I wanted to prove it for myself. I wanted to prove the gospel. I wanted to be sure that what I believed was provable. 
I didn't just want to tell somebody else, believe it. And I was young. You see, I was young. So how would I prove to another young person that this Jesus is Christ? I, I was saying to God then, as a kid, I would say, Lord, I've got to have proof. I've got to have proof. I've got to have proof. And he gave me so many. So many. So many. So many. My life was literally written with wonders and wonders and wonders and signs, miracles. So many. Glory to God. Yeah, he is provable. Amen. Because he's real. So I want to I want to explain a few things to you tonight. Five facts of the gospel. Just to help your understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Five important facts of the gospel. That these are facts. See, it's my first time here. Uh, it's important for me to share with you the gospel which I preach. The gospel which I live. Okay? I, I don't want you to... You're not just going to be hearing a preacher. This is not a sermon. I'm sharing with you my soonnesses, my cogitations of Christ. You understand? These are the outflows of my spirit. What I share with you. Number one. The new birth and eternal life. They are simple things. Simple but eternal verities. Number one. The new birth and eternal life. Which means eternal life is a fact. It is a fact. The new birth is a fact. Jesus said, For God so loved the world. John 3.16, every kid knows it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's not a promise. That's a law. That's a decree. I want you to listen to the language. Whosoever. He says, for God so loved the world. That anyone. He gave his only begotten son. That anybody who believes. Anyone who believes in him. Should not perish. The world should. It's a decree. God decreed that anybody who believes in Jesus should not perish. He's set aside from among those to perish. But have. Have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. Think about it. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. If any man be in Christ, listen to the tenses. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. These are either facts or what is even as else. Listen to the language. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold. All things are become new. And, and, and that's the key there. I want you to listen to it. If any man be in Christ. You see, when you come to Christ, you receive salvation. Remember, you're born into him. All right? You're now a member. The Bible says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Okay? So, baptized into that body of Christ. We're baptized into him. If any man be in Christ, he is not going to be. It's not a promise. He is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, he says, see, all things are become new. See. Okay. You had a blood disease when you were born of your mother. Now, you're born again, you still have the disease. How could that be? How could that be? 
That means what you took up was a religion, not eternal life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new species, a new type of being. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's either true or false. There's no middle ground. Can you see it? Of his own will, James 1.18, of his own will begat he us by the word of truth that we should be a kind, a type of first fruits of his creatures. What does that mean? First fruit means the first and the best. That's what it is. That we should be. He says, of his own will, he gave birth to us. That we should be a type, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You see, you just sang it. I know who I am. That's what that song was telling you. So who are you? You ask yourself, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I I really? If I'm born again, it means, and hear, hear this, the life with which you were born of your mother and your father ceased to be when you were born again. You gotta understand this. Study in Romans chapter seven, you'd be amazed at what you find. That human life was supplanted by the life and nature of God when you were born again. Your body houses a new type of life. It's not the same life from your daddy. You're a new creature. And I like the King James rendering of that verse because the newer ones say a new creation. You say, what's the, what's the difference? There's a slight difference, but an important one. You see, it's a new creation, yes. But the King James picks the actual word. He says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Think about, let me give you a picture like this. Imagine that you were outside and you saw some animal just run across the yard. And someone said, what's that? He said, I, 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 I didn't really get to see it, but it's some kind of creature. You see, you, you are unable to describe it. So you say it's some kind of creature. It, it's, a, it's something strange. Yes, in the realm of the spirit, when you were born again, you were not the kind of person you used to be. You're a new man, a new being, a new person, a new creature in Christ Jesus. (laughs) Hallelujah. You're still there? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So you know who you are. Yeah, really true. And how often have you meditated on that fact? In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23, he says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Not of destructible seed, not of perishable seed, but of incorruptible, imperishable. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That means you were born of the word. What does that mean? Jesus Christ is the word become flesh. You are born of the word. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Everything came from the word. Actually, that's the reason. Relax. You see, uh, there's so much to share with you. And I'm thinking, I got only one evening so okay you're still here hello 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 of his own will begat he us by the word of truth and now peter says being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which liveth and abideth forever the greatest miracles are performed with words see the performed with words i wish you understand the power of your words Glory to God. 
Let me show you this. First John chapter 5 from verse 11. Okay, somebody said one time he, he, he didn't open the Bible once. But I've been quoting scripture for you. Okay, open this one. First John chapter 5 from verse 11. Read it for me. Want to go. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, some of you are just trying to look for it. Have you found it now? <laughs> okay, so we'll take it again. First John chapter 5 from verse 11. One, two, go. This is the record. I love it. Oh, dear Lord Jesus. How wonderful. It says, this is the record. This is the testimony that God has given us. He's not going to give us. He's not going to do it when we pray hard enough. No, that God has given us. Listen to the tenses. He's already done it. That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Anybody that has the son has life. I said it's a fact. Eternal life is a fact. If you're born again, you have eternal life. It's a fact. It's not a promise. It's a fact. It has happened. You got it now in your life. Learn to activate that life within you. You see, if you don't know about it, you'll never put it to work. You never put it to work. You believe in the human life, even though you have a divine life. You believe in something different without knowing because you were not taught. You got to learn it. You got to be taught. Even human beings, as they grow up, as little kids, the boys and the girls act the same way. But gradually, the parents start telling them, you're a boy, act like this. You're a boy. They're telling him he's a boy not to act like a girl. And then they tell the girl, you're a girl, sit like this. You get it. You see, they're, they're, they're training them now. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. In Christianity, that's what's needed. You got to train people how to live this life that they have received. When you understand it and learn to walk in the light of it, you will no longer say, Bible says, they that dwell therein shall not say, I am sick. Why? Because they have learned. They have learned. Like Paul. He said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be independent of circumstances. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> what will it be like when you're independent of circumstances? It's something you got to learn. See, understand this. The Lord has placed all things under our control. The only thing that's not under your control is the life of another person. You have no control over the decisions by someone else. But everything that touches your life, you have control. You have control. You, you cannot say, you know, my asthma, my asthma. Uh, how did it become your asthma? <laughs> and why will God take away from you the, something you've claimed? It belongs to you. <laughs> I had my asthma five years ago. Your asthma? I've been fighting with my cancer for two years now. It's your cancer? Oh, why are you keeping it? And then we're looking, oh, pray for me, pray for me. You know, a noble man came to Jesus and said, Master, please follow me. Come heal my son. He is at the point of death. How urgent would that, could that be? So urgent. He needed the master's attention now. What did Jesus say? 
He said to the man, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. He refused to go. He said, go home. Your son lives. He spoke words. Your son lives. Then the Bible says, the man believed the words that Jesus spoke unto him and went his way. The man believed the words. He believed and went his way. On his journey, the servants met him and said, good news, master. Your son lives. He said, when did he begin to amend? They said, yesterday at the seventh hour. And he realized it was the same moment when Jesus said, thy son lives. Hallelujah. If I spoke those words to you today, would you receive them? Would you accept them? Yes. Yes. You see, the Bible is full of wonderful testimonies, wonderful stories. Moses called water out of the rock. I tell people, we're the ones to bring water out of the rock today. We're living today. This is, this is our day. Wonderful title of your program. This is your day. It doesn't get better than that. This is your day. This is your day. This is your moment. See, this has to be your story. Did you get it? This has to be your story. Things have changed. This is not theory. This is putting the word of God to work. This is acting the word. We are practitioners of the word. We live the word. Hmm. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm on number one. Is that true? <laughs> I told you five. You know, I, I could preach for each one. Each one of these five points I could take for a month. Yeah. Because I've got so much to tell you on each one of them. But I'm not going to do that tonight. Number two. The righteousness of God is a fact. Blessed Jesus. Oh boy. The righteousness of God is a fact. It is a fact. Hi. Hey, what is the righteousness of God? We're talking about the will and nature of the Father. The will and nature of the Father. This is righteousness. How do you tell what, what is righteous? How do you know what is right? How do you know? God. God is righteousness. He is righteousness. He is my righteousness. Someone has rightly described it as right standing. Yes, that's right standing when you're talking about the other fellow. Who has a right standing in the presence of another. But there's a better description. It is the rightness of God at work in a human being. The rightness of God at work in a human being. It is divinity manifested in humanity. It is the unveiling of the Father's heart. Righteousness. It's God's life and love at work in you. That's what it is. It is a fact. We are now in the presence of the Father without a sense of guilt or condemnation or inferiority. No wonder we are not afraid in His presence. He's given us His own righteousness, His rightness, His ability to do right. Can you imagine that? To live in consonance with the Father. You walk in light of His Word. You know Him. He knows you. And now you have become one with Him. Oh boy. Righteousness is a fact. He has made us righteous. We never have to struggle again to please Him. It's our life now. It's our nature now. We just live before Him in righteousness and true holiness. Another translation calls it holiness of truth. That's amazing. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Glory to God. Yes, you're born again. Now think about it. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being declared righteous by faith, we are at peace with God. 
oneness with God. It's like two nations have come to terms of peace. You see that? And now we and our Heavenly Father are at one. We think the same way now. You see, he's given, Bible says we have the mind of Christ. I think like him. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I'll tell you about that later. Think about it. We've got the same mind with him. We have his righteousness. It's a gift. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. They shall reign in life. Oh, my back. Oh, you're not raining like that. Oh, when are you going to say, out? <laughs> you may talk like, God, get out, go. It's not going to go like that. I rebuke you, I rebuke you, I rebuke you. It's not going to go like that. See, after all, you've done it for three years now. It hasn't gone yet. Because it's out of me, out of me, out of me, out of me, out of me. You tell a dog, go out, go out, go out, go out. Go out, go out, go out. And that's not a rebel. Now you're dealing with a demon that's a rebel. And you're saying, out of me, out of me, out of me. Go, go, go. Out of me, out of me, out of me. No, there are different levels of authority. For example, when I'm at the healing school, sometimes I do this to the devil. I just, I do this. I don't have to say anything to him. He understands. And sometimes I look at them and they've got to go. I don't say anything. Because they understand why I'm there. I didn't come to play games. See? So, they get it. But if, if the devil had the boldness to do something, afflict your body, and there's this growth or something you're wrestling with, and you're saying, go from me, go, go from me. There's not going to go that way. Tell you what to do. Shut your doors. Put the telephone off. It's a Satan in the name of Jesus. Oh, my body. Somebody said, I said it, but it was still there. Uh uh. No, you didn't say it right. Say something more. This body belongs to God, it is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You got to say something. Don't just be quiet. Do you know how many Christians have died sick? Remember this. The disciples were in a boat. Jesus came walking on the water. And then Peter called out because they were afraid. They thought he was a ghost. And Jesus said, be not afraid. I'm the one. And Peter said, master, if you're the one, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus says, come. He got out of the boat and walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter actually walked on the water. He did. Then he turned away and saw the, he saw the waves. They were so high. And, and fear got a hold of him. And the Bible says he began to sink. Now, what gets my attention there is this. The Bible says Jesus got him quickly. Meaning... He could have sunk before Jesus. Before Jesus? Yes. You can sink in his presence. But because it was at Jesus' invitation, Jesus had to take responsibility. The Bible says he got a hold of him quickly. And he said to him, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Many Christians have sunk in the presence of Jesus. Why they saying, I'm healed, I'm healed. They're dying. I'm healed, I'm healed. That's not what you're going to say. I'm healed? No. <laughs> Healing. Oh. Healing is for babies. I know many Christians don't like to hear it, but it's true. Jesus called it the children's bread. 
Healing is for babies. You say, what if you fell down and you had an injury? Well, there is a, there is a, a natural way, a natural process for the restoration of your body. That's not a problem. It will heal itself. I'm talking about divine healing. Divine healing is for babies. So what's for you? Until you know who you are, that will be theory. That's why there has to be a training. See, God's word has to be taught. God's children have to learn it. It's not a preaching. It's not a sermon. It's not something you hear and run off with it. No. I, I told you, these are things that have been in my spirit for how long? Oh my goodness. All these many years. These have been my meditations. See, the word of God. I've been, I've been consuming the word into my spirit. Francis of Assisi said, if you cut this body, he said, you find the imprint of Christ in my heart. Yes. I thought about that. I said, what does my body say? What's the message from my body? My whole spirit, soul, and body inundated completely by the life and nature of Christ. For as he is, so are we in this world. You understand it? It's our life. Righteousness is a fact. Satan is afraid of us. Because, uh, look at this. Not only did he make us righteous, he said something so powerful about us. It's one of the biggest verses of all the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He put it the other way. First, we talked about he made us righteous. He gave us the gift of righteousness. That was wonderful. He didn't stop there. He went to this one and he called us the righteousness of God. Do you understand what that means? I am now the unveiling of the Father's righteousness. I am the manifestation of his righteousness. I am now the outworking of God's righteousness. Oh God, what does this mean? So if I come into a matter, I'm not there to decide who is right and who is wrong. I bring forth the judgments of God. I bring forth the righteousness of God. That's my ministry. That's amazing. It's amazing. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the unveiling of his glory. I know who I am. Hallelujah. I know who I am. I'm the unveiling of God's glory. Listen and listen hard. This is very important. What do you use the word for? When you study the word. Because I'm talking to you, I'm sharing these things with you. What do you use the word for? What do you think it is? When you study the word, you're hearing God. It's God talking to you. You've got to respond to God. It's something many Christians don't understand. They haven't learned it. They don't know they have to respond to God. When God talks to you, you've got to respond. Samuel, as a young man, was taught by Eli the priest. The Bible tells us that a voice spoke and called his name, Samuel. And he rushed to Eli the priest. He said, sir. The man said, I didn't call you. He went back. He said, I thought you called me. Again, the voice spoke, Samuel. He ran again to the priest. Sir, I didn't call you. He said, sir, you called me. He went back to his room. Again, Samuel. Sir! Isn't it wonderful? Samuel was not a dunce. It must mean that when God called him, he called him with Eli's voice. That's why a lot of times God speaks to you through the voice of the minister that he has sent into your life. So he speaks with the voice of a human. It didn't sound like some beast outside. Three times he went to Eli. And the Bible tells us. 
When he came again, Eli realized the Lord had called the boy. He had to teach him. He said, come, let me tell you something. The next time you hear that voice, he said, you've got to respond to him. He says, say to him, watch this. First time God calls, the boy's running. Doesn't God know he's running to Eli? Doesn't God know? Doesn't God know? Doesn't he see him running to Eli? Why doesn't God say, stop, I'm the one calling you? He doesn't operate like that. He lets him go. He leaves the responsibility of the training to Eli. Second time the boy's running, God should have said, stop, stop, I'm the one talking to you. No, he doesn't do that. He let him go. Somebody said, if God's talking to me, I'm going to know it. Yes, if you're taught. If you're taught. You know, when I first started early in the ministry, I was learning these things. And I said to the Lord, but everybody ought to know. No, he said, no. He said, my sheep know my voice. I said, yes, Lord, so they know your voice. He said, but the lambs followed the bleeding of the sheep. The lambs don't know the voice of the shepherd. They're listening to what the sheep are doing. So that's what he said to me. Remember, he said to Peter, Simon, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord. He said, feed my sheep. Then he said, feed my sheep. He said, feed my lambs. The lambs are different. They're babes. So Eli said to him, Next time you hear that voice, say to him, speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. He went back. And sure enough, God called again. And then he said, speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. And then the Lord gave the message to him. How important is that? You've got to be taught to respond to God. Respond. Don't just read it. Don't just quote it. You've got to respond. Your response is where the blessing is. Your response is where the blessing is. Are you going to respond? Are you ready to respond? Are you sure? You will respond? Okay, let's see how you're going to do that. Number three, the dominion of Christ. Yes. Christ reigns in me. Christ reigns through me. Hallelujah. Christ reigns in me. Can you say amen? amen. He reigns in my life. He speaks through me. Hallelujah. Jesus said, in my name they shall cast out devils. The dominion of Christ in my life. Christ reigns in me. Do you cast out devils? How many of you have cast out devils? How come not many of you? You think all the devils have gone to Africa? <laughs> Pastor Benny, you know, that's what a lot of people think. They don't think that there are devils anywhere. They think that the devils are lodging in Africa. They say, oh, those poor people, they got a lot of devils. Their demons are really there. <laughs> Dear Lord Jesus. How many of you here I can't hear from one ear? Stand up. You don't hear from one ear. <laughs> Somebody say, how about two ears? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't call for that because you wouldn't have heard me anyway. <laughs> so I called for one. I have a reason for that. I have a reason for, for asking for that. Put your hand into the ear that has been deaf. Okay? I understand that we've got a few people in the overflow. Is that true? All right, if you're in the overflow, put your finger in that ear that's been deaf. And if you're watching, well, why do I see if you're watching? You are watching. <laughs> so, 
If you got one deaf ear, it means you can still hear me with the other one. Put your finger into the ear that has been deaf. You know, it's pretty simple. I'm just trying to show you something about casting out devils. Our devil of deafness in the name of Jesus, you come out of their ears, come out now, and hearing be restored to their ears now in Jesus' name. All right. Close the good one, the one that had been good, and start hearing me from the other one. All right. You can hear me now. You can hear me. You can hear me? You can hear me? Tell me. Tell me. You can hear? You can hear from that. All right? You too. You can hear. With that ear, you can hear from it now. All right. Glory to God. You can hear from this ear now. Great. Well, thank God, thank God. Give him praise. Thank you. Sit down. What I just wanted you to see there, uh, how, how hard was that? How hard was that? How hard was that? Very easy, right? What did I do? I said, Satan, you get out of their ears, right? That's casting out devils. Because most, not all, most hearing problems are caused by demons. Most, not all of them. But most are caused by demons. And you'll be amazed at the afflictions that people have that have come from demons. Demons, devils, spirits of infirmity. And until you learn to cast out devils, it's so important. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, number one, in my name, they shall cast out devils. How important is that? We let a lot of things happen in our lives, in our bodies, in things that have to do with us. Not realizing that Satan is behind them. Learn to cast out devils. Learn to cast out devils. It's very simple. You'll be surprised at the changes that will take place. Listen, they outnumber the human beings on earth. So Satan is not moved by you casting out devils, to be sure. That you're casting out devils doesn't mean that he's troubled. He's not troubled. He just changes his approach. You understand? But you've got to cast them out. All the same. Hello. <laughs> Did you, uh, do you know how much it will cost you to open a deaf ear? cost you a lot of money but that happened in a few seconds right in a word in a word in a word someone if you came here with cancer just raise your hand where you are just raise your hand where you are you came with cancer There's one here, and there's one other there, and there's one else there. Okay. How long has it been? Two years. What's your name? Where is it? Where is the cancer? In your... In your lungs. Come here. Just stand there. Here. Okay. Reverend Tom, please come around. Good. It's been there for two years.
and your bones too. Okay. Jesus is here. You know. Precious Lord Jesus. Oh. Out of her. Return no more to her. Return no more to her. Those things are caused by devils. Pick her up. Come. Come here. Come closer. Take a deep breath. Now put your nose in and out. Do it again. One more time. It's done. You're healed. Hallelujah. The dominion of Christ is a fact. It's a fact. It's a fact. He's given us dominion over all things. It's a fact. It's a fact. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's a fact. We have the dominion. We have the dominion over all things. Oh, glory to God. Remember, in Philippians chapter 2, from verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in the form of a servant, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name my brothers and sisters in Christ the name of Jesus is above every name God so highly exalted him the church hasn't used the name of Jesus we've been acting like we are victims but you know what? The teaching of the word is coming out. Many don't know who we are. They think we are disadvantaged. They think like we need some, you know, some, some help from somebody. They don't know that the name of Jesus is to be used in this world. They don't understand it. But they are soon going to learn it. They are soon going to learn it. Yeah. They will soon discover how to use the name of Jesus Christ. You know, I remember one day we were ministering to some people. And I was just resting for a while. And one of the guys went to a deaf mute, commanding the devil to come out, come out. And, and he was neither hearing nor talking. So I was watching them. And he would test him and he would try again. He would test him, he would try again. I was just resting. After a while, I thought, this nonsense is taking too long. <laughs> so I went and I said, Ouch! And fought with a devil went out and he started hearing and talking. Now, what was the difference? Why was he using the name of Jesus and nothing was happening? And I'm using the same name and something's happening. That's something you need to learn. Why will someone say, in the name of Jesus? And then another one says, in the name of Jesus. Why is there a difference? It's the same name of Jesus. Why is there a difference? You have to learn it. You have to be taught. You see? And when you learn it, it becomes yours. That's what I, that's something beautiful about the word of God. See, I could come here and just... When I go to the healing school, Pastor Benny, 
during the healing service, I don't preach. It's a healing service. I don't preach in a healing service. I heal in a healing service. The moment I enter from the beginning till the last person is over, and sometimes I've got maybe about a thousand people, okay, to lay hands on. We have sometimes a little over a thousand people, right? And I'm going to lay hands on everybody. And then I do it in about 20 minutes. And they're surprised. How can that be so fast? And people come from all over, all over the world. And they come to watch that. They're in the service and they're watching. You know? In one service I had 36 people on wheelchairs and stretchers. Okay? And they're all jumping off of the beds and coming off. The, yeah? Including those who can't even get on the stretcher. They have to be on a mattress on the floor. All right? And I don't mean they're all from Africa. They're from all around the world. <laughs> yeah, you got to know that. It's important. Because sickness has no respect. It takes a hold of people, sometimes leaders of nations. It's amazing what happens. But the name of Jesus is above all. Yeah. Amen. So, when we come into such a meeting, I don't preach. If I'm going to give any exhortation, it will be at the end. When I finish, after all the healing, then I counsel. And say, never be sick again. See, that's the only preaching. Five minutes, ten minutes, I, I do the preaching at the end. But it's a healing service, and so I start healing. I don't sing. No singing, nothing. Yeah, sure. I just come in and I start healing. And I finish the healing and I cancel. And I say bye bye. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory what am I saying to you? The dominion of Christ is a fact. Yes. He's brought us into the dominion. Yes. We are no longer victims. As He is, so are we in this world. Yes, Jesus said, Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So he gave me the victory. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. See, he said it, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So I don't just recite that. I've got to respond. Yes, Lord. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He says, all things are yours. Then I say, yes, Lord. All things are mine. Hallelujah. Pastor Benny, to meet you, to be here, has to be the power of God. How could I know Pastor Benny? How could I? How could I be here? How could I even be standing here? That's Christ. Christ made that happen. Because he said it will be so. And it turned out to be so. His word doesn't fail. Years ago, uh, it was uh, 1996, and I'm in my office, and I'm thinking, Lord, do I contact them? I'm thinking I'm a young preacher. I'm just, you know, and, and I'm thinking, oh, who do I get to connect with? Oh, Lord, I thought about the first one. Lord, uh, and then Pastor Benny's name is number two. Uh, and I'm thinking, Lord, do I contact them? About three feet above my head, the voice of God speaks. He says, don't do it. He says, I'll get them to contact you. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. He doesn't fail. He's alive. We're not serving an idol. He's not a God of wood, stone, or iron. That have eyes that don't see, ears that don't hear, legs that never move. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
He's real, the living God. Your spine is healed. He's the living God. Your spine is healed. Get up if you have a problem with your spine. It's healed. It's healed. It's healed. It's healed. Move your body over your back because it's healed. It's healed. That infirmity is gone from you. It's gone. It's gone from you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's gone from you. Amen. All right, because you got to write this down, you know. I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure we can complete this because put the write them down. So I gave you number one for the five solid facts of the gospel. Five solid facts. If you didn't hear the word solid the first time, put it now. Five solid facts of the gospel. The new birth and eternal life. Yes, that's a fact. Number two, the righteousness of God. Number three, the dominion of Christ. Number four, the fellowship of the Spirit is a fact. Hallelujah. That's what you brought to me, Pastor Benny. The fellowship of the Spirit. Getting to know the Holy Ghost. And I've been on my walk ever since with the Holy Ghost. You realize we've got... We've got the number one daily devotional in the world. Think about it. How could that even happen? 850 million copies around the world. By the end of this world, th this year, we'll have more than a billion copies in circulation around this world. How could that happen? Through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In 807 languages of the world. Think about it. And there's no major city that you get into in this world. Now we've got two million, more than two million cities around the world where we've got our materials. And there are three million of those cities. By the end of this year, we'll cover every city. Because we're into penetration now. Then from the cities, we start going into the countries, into their towns and villages. Jesus said, this gospel, that's the last sign. I'll tell you about it. The fellowship of the Spirit, you need it in your life. When you are at one with the Holy Ghost, fellowshipping with Him, knowing Him as a person, I had known Him as a power. And I was walking with His power. And then Pastor Benny said, say good morning, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Say good morning, Holy Spirit. Talk to him like a person. I said, wow, I can talk to him like a person. I've been feeling him. I've been moving like this with him. I could get, you know, in my meditations, the power be coursing through my being. I could feel that power, you know. But now I saw that he was more than a power. He was a person. No wonder Jesus said he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. He will guide you into all truths. I, what he has done in my life. Oh, I talk to him more than any human being. I'm always talking with the Holy Ghost. That's my life. I'm in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Every day, every time. You know, I believe you have to have times of prayer, special times of prayer. I do that and I teach it. But aside that, I'm in constant fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Always in communion. I didn't know that was possible until I found out. Oh boy. What will happen to you? If you're in constant fellowship with the Holy Ghost, you will never lose your way. Jesus said, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. You will not be in darkness about your money. You will not be in darkness about your business. You will not be in darkness about your ministry, about tomorrow, about the future. You will not be in darkness, but you have the light of life. Hallelujah. Follow the Holy Ghost. He will teach you all things. There's too many Christians going to the doctor and asking the doctor what's wrong with them. There's a doctor. I feel this and I feel that. Can you find out what's wrong with me? I found out the Holy Ghost knows. When I speak in tongues, he tells me. When I speak in tongues, he tells me. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edified himself. Yeah. Speak in tongues. 
Learn to speak in tongues frequently. Speak in tongues. Stay of the power of God in your spirit. Speak in tongues. Are you hearing me? Listen, listen. You'll discover you'll never run out of power. You'll never have a dryness in your life when you learn to speak in tongues. Don't take that lightly. Every now and then, find a place for yourself. Liba satakayala, rada la bando la bosataya. Liba manto kasika haya, mara bando la bosataya. Hallelujah. Speak in tongues. Are you hearing me? It's very important. It's not only when something happens. Now you want turbo charging. You know, because it's a problem. But you, if you're always speaking in tongues, he will lead you. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will help you navigate your way through life. Are you hearing me? Yes. The Bible says the wise see trouble afar off. And they take the right way. But the fools go on and are punished. Learn to speak in tongues. Learn to stay up the power that is inside you. You already have that in you. In your fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Don't just make your life a matter of stories of pain and trouble. Every time a lot of people want to pray. All they have is to tell him what they want. What, what oh God I need this and I want that. And that's not the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is far removed from making demands. After all he said all things are yours. What are you still asking for? Do you realize in my prayer. I don't ask God for things. What will I ask him for? For money? I don't ask God for money. How could I ask him for money? He told me how to get money. I call money by name. Yeah. I don't ask for money. How can I ask him for money? I don't ask God for things. What will I be asking him for? He and I rule the world. The earth belongs to us. Listen. You've never seen wealth like the kind that the church is about to see. And there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. There are too many of God's people who think they need some help. You know, they're asking God for so little. And they even get angry at God. They say, oh Lord, this is all I'm asking you for and you haven't done it yet. That's the problem. You're asking for something that's already yours. Why don't you just say what you want? You say, is, uh, is it that simple? Yes, it is simpler than that. It is simpler than that. Listen, I've been in ministry now for how many years? Dear Lord. Oh, okay, by the time I tell you, you start trying to guess my age. <laughs> <laughs> but um, definitely more than 30 years, okay? Okay, so that can help you a little bit. I've always had more than I require. More. So much more. So much more. In abundance. And when I say abundance, I mean super abundance. It's got to be. It's got to be. It couldn't have been any other way. You say, Pastor Christ, are you saying... You, you don't. I am telling you emphatically. I have some pastors here who have known me for years. Reverend Tom, how many years have you been with me? Over three decades. <laughs> More than 30 years of his life he's been with me. They're here. I, I can ask. Yeah, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. Why is that so? Because it's got to be so. There's no other way. There's no other way. And God's children have to learn it. They've got to learn it. We've got to teach them. We've got to show them how to live above the world's limits. Because Jesus died for us. He died and gave us the estate. And now we are operators of our father's estate. And there's no lack for us. And that's why we're going to shake this world. Yes, we're going to shake this world. 
they can, they can try the different laws they want to. But with the name of Jesus, we are in control. They don't know it, but we'll let them know it. We're in control. No, they're not in control. We are in control. With the name of Jesus. What you don't want in your country, use the name of Jesus. At a certain stage, you need many, many of God's people come together to do that. As they learn more, fewer of them will be necessary. As they learn more, even fewer of them. Then you come to the place where you alone. There are some things I do. And I say, Lord, I don't need many people to join me to do that. I don't need many people to join me to do that. You've, you've taught me good enough. And I can take responsibility and I can act. And there in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I want it this way. Within 24 hours, there's a change. Yeah. That's the way it's supposed to be. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Put your hands around your body. Put your hands around your body. Now it doesn't matter what your case is. It doesn't matter what trouble brought you here. Just put your hands around your body. Yes, just keep playing. Pastor Benny, this is a holy place. This is a holy place. This is a place where the Spirit of God has been ministering. How can anybody come in here and go back the same? It's not possible. You don't come here and go away the, the way you came. God's presence is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the voice of angels sing. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can His my and His grace. standing take the last ones so that you can take them home 
you're gonna you're gonna be standing with me for the last one okay I've given you four already right yes. number five and it's very important the ascension of Christ and the promise of his return it's a fact his ascension is a fact with the promise that he's coming back these are five solid facts of the gospel Acts chapter 1 Read from verse 8. From verse 8. Have you seen it? Acts chapter 1 from verse 8. Read now. 1, 2, go. You shall receive power. 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 Uh-huh. Yes. Keep reading. Uh huh. Uh huh. And unto the utmost part of the world. Good. Verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Jesus Christ. Pastor Benny. This portion of the Bible, I found out, has not been emphasized enough around the world. We talk a lot about the resurrection of Jesus because it is so important. Because if you don't believe in the resurrection, you're not a Christian. To become a Christian, you must believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. You must. If you doubt his resurrection, you're not a Christian. You understand that? The resurrection is the birth of Christianity. Christianity didn't start at the cross. It started at the resurrection. You understand it? Very important. But here is something I want you to notice. Jesus ascended. Up till then, his siblings didn't believe in him. They were in the same house. From the same mother. They heard him. They heard his preaching. They heard him. They saw his miracles. But one thing they could not accept was that he said he was born from above that they believed was a lie because they knew his mother they said we are from the same home his mother is my mother we eat the same food we live in the same house he is not from above at his death we are told his mother was there where were his brothers and sisters no mention they thought maybe he was punished for his uh, stubbornness. But then they heard he had been raised from the dead. He was alive. He resurrected. Where is he? They heard him. They are in doubt of him. They know the prophets raised the dead. And not even Jesus raised the dead. That may have been a great miracle. But then they, they couldn't put it together. Who is he? Brothers and sisters, he made an appointment with his disciples in Galilee. He said, meet me up in Galilee. And they went. He spoke last words to them. The Bible says while they were still listening to him, Jesus levitated 
You know, one day I was praying years ago. I called the name of Jesus and I said, it's my righteousness. I was lifted a foot in the air. And I was in the air for calling Jesus my righteousness. And then gradually lowered to the ground. Another occasion I called Jesus my righteousness. I passed out. I woke up several meters inside the bush. And I was not afraid. I felt like remaining there. And these tall grasses. I opened my eyes. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. What am I doing here? The last thing I remembered was I called him Jesus, my righteousness. But he levitated. He didn't go back down. He kept going upward. They're looking at him. His brothers were there. His sisters were there. His mother was there. Others were there. He's going up. Jesus did not suddenly vanish. Are you hearing me? No. He ascended. They saw him going upward and upward. What do you do with this? Who do we tell? What's going on? And then he's going. And he waves to them. I'll see you again. Do they pass out? Who do you tell? Then he goes right into the clouds. Dear God, his brothers just realized that man that they grew up with in that home was himself God. How can we tell it now? We have been living with God and we didn't, we didn't know it. We ate with God and we didn't know it. He went back to his room. Oh, he was my brother. But he was God. How can I tell the world? He was my brother. But he was God. Now, they want to tell everybody. He was God. He came from above. Brothers and sisters, that's what I want you to know. He surely came from above. He went beyond the clouds. And one day, he'll come back. One day very soon, the last Sunday service would have held. The last church service would have held. The last TV broadcast would have ended. One day, the last sinner would have been brought in. One day, all these things were doing. The last service would have been preached. Yes, one day. One of these days, it will all be over. For the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's why we're doing all this. The hope of every Christian, he that has this hope in him, purified himself even as he is pure. Brothers and sisters, what we're doing is not for nothing. My eyes are on the return of Christ. I know he's coming back. I'm watching out for him. I know he's coming back. That's why I'm preaching. I'm hurrying. I'm working quickly. I'm trying my best so we can reach to the nations of the world. We're doing so much at the same time on every platform. Yes, because he's coming again. And I want him to come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Yes, lift your hands toward heaven. Worship here. Worship here. Worship here. Worship here. Worship here. You at home, worship here. Thank him for his love, for his grace, for his kindness. Wherever you are, worship him. Thank him for who he is, for what he's done for you. Jesus Christ, son of the living God, who gave himself for you, that you may be brought into fellowship with the Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
worship you. Whether you're in your home, in a meeting somewhere, watching us, participating in this service. If you haven't known Jesus Christ as your Lord, if you haven't received him into your heart, it's time to do so. If you haven't received eternal life, it's time to do so. Ask him to come into your heart. Say, Lord, I receive you into my heart. Believe in him. Believe that God raised him from the dead and he's alive today. And declare him Lord with your mouth. So you're Lord of my life. You're Lord of my life. I believe in you. Precious Jesus, I believe in you. Receive him into your heart. Receive him into your heart. And you can write to Pastor Benny and tell him that on this day, during this service, you receive Jesus Christ into your heart. Write. Use the address on the screen. Write and say, I receive Jesus into my heart. Yes. Lift your hands everywhere. Worship him by yourself. Open your mouth. Worship him by yourself. Pastor Benny, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pray out loud, saints. Every voice.